So welcome again for those of you who just joined. I'm Kate Bulkley and I'm uh, running this, moderating this RTS National uh, Committee event. Game on! The new world of opportunity in franchises across video games and television. And we also might mention film occasionally as well, but mostly across video games and television. This is a really uh, interesting topic, so I'm glad you're all here. If you don't know me, I'm a media correspondent and commentator based in the UK, despite my uh, US accent. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. That is obviously at the bottom of your screen. Most of us know how all that works. Uh, and I will try to get to your questions. We will try to maybe do them as we go. And then we will also have hopefully some time at the end to do questions. So if you have a question, please put it in the box. Somebody's managing that for me, so I will see them. Um, just to kind of set us up, uh, as you know, broadcasters and streamers are battling for the attention of this, what we might call the smartphone generation. Uh, they're looking increasingly for creative IP in the games industry and from the games industry to help them capture viewers. I mean, look at Netflix adapting Riot Games League of Legends that uh, was called Arcane. It came out in late 2021. But it's really the release this year of The Last of Us on HBO, which had an average, I'm told, of 30 million viewers across the series, that some believe this heralds the tipping point possibly for successful success, successfully, try to say that three times fast, successfully adapting intellectual property from a game to a TV or to a film. Um, so are we in a new era of crossover IP? Will it actually work on a sort of bigger scale this time around? Are gaming and TV film now able to better share stories? Are they better able to leverage technology and also to share talent. So to discuss all this, we have a very interesting panel with us here today. And I'm gonna just introduce them to you briefly. And then we're gonna just sort of do one question uh, and then we'll get into the main topic of what we're doing. So we've got Chris Salvaterra. Uh, Chris, we just wave a little bit. Chris Salvaterra is the HBO network, network executive on The Last of Us. So it's really great to have you here, Chris. Um, he's also senior vice president of original programming and drama series for HBO. Uh, next, we have uh, Ian Livingston. Uh, Ian, just give us a wave. He's the one in front of all the, the looks like those are video games. <laughs> um, and Ian is a games entrepreneur. He's a co-founder of Hero Capital. So thank you for being with us, Ian. Uh, Johnny Slow, if you'd give us a wave, Johnny. Johnny is the CEO of Pixo Mondo. That's a VFX and virtual production studio. It was recently acquired by Sony Pictures. Uh, and Johnny's recently moved back from LA to the UK. And actually, I should say that Chris is actually joining us from LA. So thank you, Chris, for waking up early. Um, and last but not least, we have Brona Monaghan. She is co-founder of Monray Management and Monray Productions. It's a talent agency and a production studio. And they seem to focus on gaming talent like Dan TDM, if you've heard of Dan TDM, which I hope all of you have. So let's start with our one question, sort of, uh, we say round one of this thing to get us, um, to get us going. Um, and let's start with um, Ian. So this crossover between games and TV and film has been a long time coming in. In fact, it's sort of been like, you know, hurry up and wait. What is the one thing that you think has sort of held things back? Just sort of, you know, quickly, sort of what's, what's the one thing that, it, it, that has been a real stumbling block? Well, there's been many, many um, dramatic interpretations of video games historically. But I think the common denominator above them all, amongst them all, is the lack of understanding of gaming intellectual property and the lack of understanding of gamers themselves. Right. Very good answer. And I've also been just told that I forgot to introduce John. <laughs> so right. I apologize to a lot of people on this panel. So John Wardell is also with us. John it runs the um, National Film School. Thank you. Sorry, he's the director. Thank you, totally John. Sorry, I forgot you. Okay. Um, so that's, Ian, I, that's a really good answer. Uh, Chris, can we go to you next? What's your sort of, what's the one thing you think that has held things back? Uh, I would say it's probably fidelity to the source material. Fidelity my... to the source material. Oh, in other words, it's been difficult to be. It, it's, it, it's, it, it's a, a challenge to find, to, to, take in the elements of of the of the IP of the video game and sort of interpret those for whatever medium it is film or television 
So that's been the challenge, I think, uh, overriding everything. Yeah, kind of how to, how to adapt it. Okay, John, uh, you're here, so I've, and I've introduced you. What's, what do you think, what's, you know, do you think the big thing, big issues? Um, well, my build on both Ian and Chris's, I think, which is, I think, the sense that TV and film makers and studios can go it alone without involving the original creators. And I think the examples we've seen this year with The Last of Us and Super Mario, which is a collaboration between Illuminations and Nintendo show, when you come together and pull your collective strengths, you do better. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Coming together. That's a good point. Johnny Slow, let's do you next. Yeah, I think that what's different about um games as an ip is that when it comes to television when it comes to film it's a world that's already been seen right and so the audience not having to imagine it and i think that brings adaptation a uh, nuanced difficulty which is you know which is tough for studios who are you know to 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 to, to work with historically but um you know i think the techniques for that are developing rapidly I see what you mean. In other words, they the gamers are you they know they've already know what they've seen. So when they translate it to a film or a TV, it's kind of tough because they they're kind of expecting something. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's right. It's not like so if you base it on a book, you know, that's people have their own interpretation of that and in, you know, in their own right. imagination. Okay. Uh Brona, what do you what's what do you think? What's the one thing? Um to be honest, I think it's probably meaning like that meaningful collaboration one of the reasons that we set up memory management and productions um was to create and prioritize those meaningful collaborations between gaming talent and the broader entertainment industry we felt particularly in the uk that no one was really cornering the market from a talent perspective i think there's you know big agencies in in america have cottoned on to the fact that gaming creators on youtube have got the biggest and most engaged audiences, whereas in the UK, it wasn't as much a focus. So that's really why we created the business because there is a gap in the market. And I guess conversations like today, bringing people from all ends of the spectrum together, that doesn't tend to happen very often. So I think actually this panel is probably the beginning of people recognizing that meaningful collaboration on this level yeah. is where you start to produce new ideas. Okay, that's great. It's interesting, we're hearing collaboration a lot. So Ian, let's start with our first big topic, which is kind of about IP or intellectual property and scripting and things like that. Give us some context. Um, you know, you've been in this game for a while, uh, you know, starting with Laura Croft. I mean, wh what's the context of this? Where have we been and where are we now? And well, <laughs> actually I've been in the games for some 47 years and starting- Oh my game. God, 47 years. <laughs> Starting Games Workshop in 1975 and launching Dungeons and Dragons in Europe and Warhammer. Then I moved into video games in the 90s. But that's, by the way, what I have seen, of course, is that the, t the distinction between film, TV and video games is that in film and TV, it's the director who controls the action. And in a video game, it's the player who controls the action. So they have a certain expectation level of how a drama or dialogue should should go. And that's historically never been understood, I think, by film and TV makers. Hence, all the awful reviews on Rotten Tomatoes of all the video <laughs> games that have been adapted for, for film primarily and TV. Right. And I think with The Last of Us, it certainly is a tipping point in how collaboration, as was mentioned earlier, and respect to the IP and understanding of the gamer, understanding of the premise, understanding of the story, has meant uh, an absolutely wonderful production, which has obviously reaped its rewards, as has said, some 30 million viewers. So the, the thing that has always been lacking, I think, is authenticity, uh, sympathy, and respect to the IP and respect to the gaming audience. And this is, you know, the game the audience is, can't be fooled, you know, when you play a game, you're solving problems, you're learning intuitively, you're, you've given agency of control, you have a real high expectation level. And if a linear producer of that content just takes the title and sees who the, the main characters are and runs a traditional film or TV adaptation, they are gonna fail because they won't meet those expectations levels. So 
the authenticity and, and the dialogue and the respect and the settings that HBO did with The Last of Us absolutely gets praise from both sides, both from traditional film and TV watchers, as well as the gaming audience. So it's for me, it's the number one thing that everyone must have learned from this is respect and authenticity. Mm. Do you think, um, I mean, Super Mario Brothers, the new one, that's done pretty well too. Is that, is that, but that's kind of a different kind of script or not? Is that also doing the same kind of things that you think The Last of Us did in terms of authenticity and being true to the game or audience, I mean, et cetera? It hasn't um, reviewed as well as The Last of Us, but it's a monumentally huge audience engaged with watching Super Mario Brothers. So it's no surprise it's been a box office success because that is, you know, game IP is the new Disney IP, is the new comic IP, and people, they might not have had enough of comics and, and traditional IP as given up by, by, by film and TV historically, but there's an incredible amount of untapped IP that is adored by tens of millions of people around the world in the games world. Let's not forget that the games industry is now a $250 billion euro industry. There's three and a half billion players that audience is growing by some 10 million people a month. It's played on all sorts of, of, of devices that are connected globally through digital platforms. So you've got an engaged uh, audience and obviously games speaks to Generation Z because they interact with everything they do from, from their smartphones to how they behave in, in society and the cultural impact and the way of aid, giving agency of control in a game really speaks to Generation Z. So. They've grown up with games. They know what to expect in games. And I think it's been proven that some of the TV and filmmakers adapting games have not grown up with games and therefore don't miss the kind of the essential part of that, 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 that um, creativity. And have, has something started to change? Because I mean, if you talk about Tomb Raider, which obviously you've been, you were involved with pretty yeah. uh, intimately. I mean, did, did that do justice to the game? Did, to, did the Tomb Raider adaptation? I think it was pretty good for the time. I and mean, we, we, I think it was like, it's, you know, over 20 years ago since we licensed it to Paramount. But I think a lot of people assumed Tomb Raider and Laura Croft was a Hollywood creation. They might not have known before that it was uh -huh. a, or it was mm -hmm. a film. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was pretty well done. I think the storyline could have been better. I thought Angelina Jolie as Lara Croft was amazing. You know, was strong, independent, intelligent, did all her own stunts, incredible character for the time. And, but it, it could have been better, of course. I mean, I think gamers would have expected more uh, authenticity in, in, in the original, in the original films based on the historic um, gameplay that they were, they previously experienced. But um, I think The Last of Us is going to really signal a uh, kind of yeah. sea change in the way games are adapted for the linear screen. Yeah. Which, of course, is a perfect transition to Chris. So, Chris, is it a sea change? <laughs> Obviously, you oversaw how this all sort of came together, which is an interesting story. Tell us a little bit about that, because you've got a game, a game writer, a gaming creator, and also Craig Mason, who is basically a... a a film, you know, TV writer, and was that the secret sauce that made it work, or was it some other things? No, I think that was the secret sauce, really. Um, you know, everybody here is talking about collaboration, um, and I think it was a, a collaboration of the of the highest order because we, we had Craig Mazin, with whom we had done Chernobyl, um, and you know, Sir Ian, you 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 mentioned authenticity, respect. Um, you know, he approached Chernobyl with a level of authenticity and respect for for the 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 people who put their lives on the line um, in that event. Um, and uh, he came in with Neil Druckmann, who created The Last of Us, the video game. Um, and he came in as a fan, really, first of the game. Um, and I think that sparked a. Uh, a great kind of mutual respect and collaboration between the two of them, where they were able to um, uh, get, get, sort of sort of give and be flexible in different ways. So Neil, to his uh, great credit, approached it as a collaboration and as a different medium. Um, he understood that there were certain things that needed to be 
changed um, uh, about the uh, the game to the adapting to the television series. Um, so really, it was this incredible mutual collaboration. Um, and, you know, we weren't looking to do a, a video game adaptation. It wasn't necessarily a bucket <laughs> for us. But we had this relationship with Craig, um, who came in and said, this is a beloved uh, video game that that is that is um, revered for its storytelling. And we think it would make a great television series. Because yeah, my question was going to be, I mean, is this something that HBO, you know, I mean, it just seems to me that's kind of a risky thing for HBO. I know HBO is about risk, but I mean, this, I mean, game adaptations don't always work. So in, in some ways it, it probably was, you probably, I mean, did you think it was risky or like you say, it was because you just trusted Craig to make sure it would work as a, as a, as a narrative arc? Yeah. Yes. And yes. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because as soon as the last of us was announced, I got, you know, dozens of calls from from agents and managers saying, I have your next video game adaptation. And I said, well, that's, that's, we're not looking for, it's not like a, a thing, um, but it's because it's Craig Mazin, and this is a very special game. Um, and I should say that I, I guess, because I'm not a gamer necessarily, I wasn't burdened with the the history of adaptations gone wrong, <laughs> okay, yeah, um, and uh, I just you know I wanted us to make a great television series that stood on its own, um, mm -hmm. but I also knew that if we got uh, again that fidelity to the source material, if we got that part right, the gaming audience would come, and my hope was that people like myself who wanted to watch great television uh, would would also come, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I want to ask John, bring in John Wardell here. Wasn't one of your graduates, didn't they direct one of the episodes? With, and Jeremy, what? Jeremy Webb directed on the series. And was that sort of a shock to you that, you know, this, somebody who was, had come out of the National Film and Television School was directing something from a game or was this a great opportunity or talk a little bit about how that yeah. Well, Jer Jeremy's of a generation where we didn't teach games at the NFTS. We've only been okay. doing it for about a decade. But he's also a very uh, successful high-end television director and has made lots of other big shows. And so we were thrilled when he was announced as one of the directors on the series. And Chris and I had a chat, and he seemed to have done a good job, I think. <laughs> what he's he, did an, he did an incredible job. Um, he directed the, the, the block that's set in Kansas City. Um, so he he was wonderful, yes. Yeah. But I think one of the things that I'm interested in is we've been teaching games now for about a decade at the NFTS, and we'd probably only have about 20 students at a time who would call themselves game students, but it's the impact of those game students on the rest of the school. So all of our composers, all of our sound designers, all of our screenwriters, all of our production designers, and so on, work on games and um, they think of themselves as composers so if you said are you a game student they say no i'm absolutely not but they have games uh in their portfolio and many of them have gone out and been successful now in games on the bafta for best games music multiple times and and that's what i think the future is is how how do we support people's careers where they can yeah. move yeah. between games television yeah. film and those boundaries, those sort of slightly false boundaries um, that have existed for a long time, even just between film and TV, break break down. Yeah. I mean, Craig, when you hear what John's saying, um, um, sorry, Chris, when you hear what uh, John is saying, do you, do you think, gosh, maybe we should look more at these guys who are writing games and, and, and hook them up with TV and, and film script writers. I mean, is this something you think, you said you're not looking for more adaptations, but you know, it worked. Yeah, well, well, that that's the balance, right? I mean, the, the and that's, that's why there have been video ad game adaptations for, you know, decades, because there's a, there's a built-in audience um, that comes with that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, I I know that we're talking about how to you know continue this trend. Um, I think every situation though is different. 
Um, and I think we have to be careful not to um, foist a formula onto uh, all of this writ large and okay, right. well now this is the way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. As Craig said, has said, uh, Craig Mazin has said often, how did we, how did we do it? Well, we cheated. Uh, we we found a game that is revered for its storytelling, uh -huh. uh, and so that that applied beautifully to the you know the uh, scripted format. Right, right. Yeah, not all games maybe have that as you say that kind of IP. Yeah. Okay. Uh, correct. But if we're if we're continuing the spirit of respect and collaboration, I do think that's the way through all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, let's, unless somebody else wants to say anything about IP or scripts, let's go to technology now. Um, and I'm going to have Johnny, uh, sort of give us a little bit of a kind of a, a contextualizing of this for us. Um, Johnny, you know, Pixamundo is obviously a VFX firm. You're, you're very involved in game engines. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's still a lot of people in the television and film industry that don't really even know what a game engine is. Um, and that actually a lot of things are being built now on, on game engines. Um, so what, what do you think maybe the advent of streaming opened, opened this up into like a TV series is much more likely to capture it in a two hour film? I mean, is there something about the, the technology that's, that's allowing this to happen now than it, that where it wasn't happening before? Uh, yeah, I think it's very much the, uh, from my perspective, it's very much the latter. The technology um, that's been developed uh, uh, for the creation um, of vid video games um, is now very sophisticated. It's been uh, uh, and becoming um, closer and closer to offering um, uh, things that are photo real. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's essentially uh, there are techniques from the video game production. Uh, industry that have wide application in in TV and film, and the use of uh, uh, video game engines is is one. Um, and just if anyone's not aware of uh, what what a game engine is, it's basically the 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 software, uh, the platform that is used to build a video game within. So it's like a three D world. Um, uh, you can go into it, put a virtual reality headset on and you can go and walk into that world um, it's very uh, modular and movable you can change everything every color every light source every um, every uh, creature and asset within that world is all completely creatable and uh, the, um, the game engines that we work with notably um, Unreal which is um, owned by Epic um interacts very uh, straightforwardly with the software that we use in visual effects the there's the sort of standard uh, software packages that that most um visual effects artists are able able to use um uh, like most industries there are probably maximum three more like two applications for each type of uh, visual effects software that's used so there's already a lot of ubiquity around industry and there's only a couple of video game engines which have been developed with tv and film use uh, in mind in mind as well so i think so that's epic epic games yeah. the unreal engine one i mean i know that was used in mandalorian and people sort of thought that mandalorian was in some ways kind of a tipping point for that but it's also been used what on star trek discovery i think you guys worked on yeah. that you worked on house of the dragon yeah which of course is hbo um, yeah. I think you're working on something for Netflix called The Last Airbender. Last Airbender, yeah. 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 So, that's, so, that's, yeah. so is that, are we seeing more of that, I guess, happen now and why? Well, so in all of those cases, including the Mandalorian, um, the video game uh, engine was used to create a 3D world that could be projected uh, or could be displayed on a massive LED screen. And uh, that technique is called uh, lots of things, it's, uh, uh, but it, I think it's clearest if it's referred to as in-camera visual effects because you're effectively shooting a background. It's like rear projection technology. It's been around for a long time, but the difference is that the game engine knows where the physical camera is. 
And so when the physical camera moves, the background changes mm -hmm. relative to the physical set and provides this sort of false parallax, which, you know, when you see it, it's through, you know, in front, it's mind blowing for the first time because it really brings a world that you would have had to wait until post-production to see to life in the studio. Obviously, there's always advantages for, for that, but mostly it's around handing creative control for those big environments back to the creative team whose name are above the door. They're not outsourcing a lot of those decisions to the post-production process, which comes much later when the money's running out and the time's running out and no one uh, and sometimes there's a there's a kind of lack of clarity and there's uh, and there's some communication issues that happen as naturally as part of that process if you bring that into the studio that's where its main advantage is and that's why game engines have been adapted right to TV and film news so interestingly sony pictures just bought your company right and you know those of us out here in journalism land would say why did they do that obviously it's a wonderful company but is it because, I mean, they've been in gaming for a while, they obviously are in uh, film and TV production. Are they trying to link these more? Do you think that's part of the thinking? I think, um, so, so Sony very specifically um, I were interested in Pixo from a kind of Sony group perspective. So we were acquired by Sony Pictures, but it's really a, a Sony group a, a, a oh, okay. sponsored a deal. And okay. that's because virtual production is one of their one of their key verticals. I, I, I don't think because it's necessarily going to sell a lot of product for them, but it, it's a very high profile. It's something which articulates their strategy, which is to create uh, fantastic um, uh, technology and sell that technology with a skilled service alongside it. And so virtual production is a very sort of easily articulatable mm -hmm. model for them, which describes what they want to do with their okay. business across, across Sony. Okay. Because, um, you know, obviously we're trying to talk about, you know, are we going to see more of these collaborations and is the game engines, are they going to help make that happen? And it sounds like in a way what you're saying is this kind of technology, the game engines are just becoming part of the whole production process much, much more, right? And so that, that's that, that's, that, that's, that's very much our, our experience is for the production is, you know, this is still quite new. Um, uh, production techniques don't innovate very fast. Um, uh, people like to wait, work the way they've worked before, just because they're always under time pressure and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot at stake. But for the production crews that we've worked with, this is very much a one-way street, right? So you could almost say, like, you know, the thing that it's they're replacing is green screen. So I, I think I'm pretty comfortable to say that if you know, if green screen as a technique did not exist, it would not now be invented because this tool is 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 so much better. Right. There's a question from the audience. Uh, for, I think it's for you, Johnny. Um, it says here, curious to know if there are any insights re-interactive film. Late Shift and Black Mirror Bandersnatch, for instance, is that something that you can answer? It's not. It's not. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Can anybody answer that? No, well, nobody can answer. I've seen, I've seen Late Shift and Bandersnatch and interacted with them, but they're 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 interesting innovations, but they're not yet uh, either very satisfying gaming experiences or narrative experiences. <laughs> okay. Band, yeah, they, Bandersnatch. Either is one or the other. Go ahead. And it's actually is a kind of branching narrative film, effectively. Yeah. But there's, there's, there aren't enough um, choices to be made of, of consequence to make it a, a long-term satisfying proposition. There are other companies in the space like Flavorworks, which is doing um, interactive film um, quite successfully that I know of in the UK. Flavorworks, okay. Um, there's another question here from the audience. Um, I think this is again for you, Johnny Slow. Uh, does Sony want its game assets to be the basis of TV shows? So, I mean, that's a that's a, a great segue to the the next point I wanted to make, which is look, that there is a natural fit with the techniques that we've been working with, which use video games derived production techniques for uh, games that are going to be adapted for TV and film, because we we start with rather than have to build. The 3D world from scratch. Um, we can take the assets that already exist within a game, and we can 
uh, adapt them uh, directly for use uh, in the uh, ultimately in the final shot. Hmm. But, the, but the, the the even more useful part of of this, in some ways, for why creative teams love it, is it allows them to experiment well in advance, right? So you know, normally pre visualization was a slightly is a slightly sort of clunky, expensive tool that um, big budget movies use hasn't really been accessible for TV. Right. But because these virtual production techniques are, are much more rapid, especially when it comes to visualizing things in a not photo real way, it is presenting planning tools and scoping tools and uh, you know all sorts of, of kind of applications that become accessible to uh, TV producers who can, for the first time, can start to visualize what they're going to be shooting before they actually shoot it. Um, and so that that is, I think that's the really exciting part um, for TV producers ultimately is it's, it's going to be a creative enabler, right. but it also is um, justifiable from a from an efficiency perspective. Not necessarily, we're not necessarily driving huge cost savings, but um, what we can deliver sometimes is a more rapid process. Okay. So Chris, when you hear that, <laughs> Did you use VP? I mean, did you use any of this game engine stuff? Do you know that if they did that on The Last of Us? Uh, no, we didn't. Um, but we we did. I know that we did everything we could. Again, fidelity to the to the game. Uh, we did everything we could to replicate uh, the game environment uh, in camera, essentially. So, um, and Neil Druckmann has said in interviews, it's it was surreal for him to walk onto a set and just see down to the last detail uh you know what they had uh rendered essentially in the oh. game yeah that, that's cool that's cool okay so i've got a couple more here let's see if these are relevant um someone named charlie wants to know what do the panel think of opportunities for utilizing game ip and unscripted so 007 road to a million for amazon etc unscripted use does anybody have a view on that um, I can speak on that. We, um, Mummery Productions, we make unscripted TV in the kids market. So our show, Let's Game, which we've done a hundred episodes of now, um, and we're just about to do a spin-off series, brings together publishers like Sega and Nintendo um, and big gaming YouTubers. So we're essentially creating Let's Play games, which kids love to watch on YouTube bringing them together with a mainstream broadcaster. And the kind of, the mission of that was to create something that parents felt comfortable with putting their kids in front of. Because I think that, you know, I'm, I'm a massive advocate for YouTube. It's where all of our talent are from. We now have YouTube kids. So there's lots of, you know, placeholders um, to protect kids and what they watch on YouTube. But I think still parents want to see gaming shows on channels that they recognize. So Sky Kids have done an amazing job at putting the, I guess, the steps in place to start showing that gaming isn't something that parents need to be scared of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's. I think what Monray are able to offer is the talent at the at the center, and a lot of the publishers have said they haven't really been interested in in broadcast or collaborating on shows like this. But because we've brought the talent. We put the talent in the middle. That's the thing that's attracted them to mm -hmm. it. So I think it's it's more just about trust and bringing the right people into yeah. the room, marrying um, the right people, putting the exactly. right people to the party, and making the collaboration work. That's 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 a good answer. Um, someone else has said, uh, no, actually that's that one. I think we've answered that one. Let's see. They're coming in fast and furious now. This is good audience. Wonderful. Um, too hot to handle. Netflix is releasing a game based on the reality show. So that's interesting. That's going the other way, right? So it's, going, it's a game coming out of the reality show. Of course, you know, Netflix is moving big into games. I'm not sure anybody can answer that, but it's interesting to see that it's actually going the other way now. Um, let's, um, let's talk about talent. We started to talk about it already, but John Wardell, if I could start with you. Um, you know, obviously you've talked about technology now. We've talked about good scripts, good IP, getting the narrative right. Um, what about the talent bit? Now you've talked a little bit about it because you obviously one of your students or former students um, directed one of the episodes of The Last of Us, but 
what are you seeing? Is crossover talent starting to happen more or is it still this kind of siloed approach that you refer to? It's, it's happening in some of those craft roles I talked about. So music, sound, um, screenwriting. I think it was interesting when Johnny was talking, I was thinking about some of the issues we face here and quite a lot of them are cultural. So um, he talked about the opportunity of um, not having to use green screen and being able to see stuff in camera. The other side of that for some filmmakers is they have to decide stuff far too early. <laughs> and they're not ready to make those decisions and they would rather use green screen because it keeps the options open later on. So we're seeing that. Uh, we're seeing game students tell us they don't wanna work on film and TV. So they've got all the skills, they know Unreal, they can drive a game engine and they're like, why do I wanna go and power a virtual production wall on a film set when I can make my own original game IP? Huh. So there are, and then also time is different in film and TV and in games. I see this quite often in virtual production shoots. We might bring games talent into that and they might be driving what's described as the brain bar, which is kind of powering the virtual production wall. And you'll say to one of them, how long is it going to be till we can turn over? And they'll go, I just need a minute. But a minute in games might be actually 20 minutes. <laughs> Whereas in film and TV, a minute is a very precise thing because you've got a whole crew standing around waiting. So none of these are problems in, in themselves, but I definitely think we're at this point where culturally these things are jarring sometimes and people are still trying to find out the best synergies. And, and so we're exploring it with an open mind. We're teaching our students about virtual production techniques. We're ensuring our game students are aware of it and our cinematography students and vice versa. And, but, um, but it's not many people in that space who go, I want to make, you know, I want to author. Neil Druckmann's quite an unusual person in that he now has directed high-end TV as well as originate a game. Most of our game students aren't interested in TV. Games is very successful. Thanks very much. We're very happy making our, you know, it's not a step up for us to move into film and TV, which is maybe how film and TV see it, which is, oh, move across into film and TV. Is There's a prestige to it. But most of the game students I speak to don't see it like that. Yeah. No, it's interesting. You, you, you talk about this sort of cultural issue and um, sort of I'm, you know, I'm better or different than you are and, you know, whether they want to work in the different spaces. I think it's fascinating. Um, there's a Simon Fell is I got a question. He says, can TV producers learn new ways of working from games producers over and above the digital humans and the virtual production, the VP and things like that? Are there other new ways of working that they can they can learn. John might have an answer and Johnny Slow might as well. Well, I'd just say almost certainly, although I'd say we're still trying to work, you know, we're trying to work with traditional film and TV producers to help them understand how to transpose their skills into this other space and what the cultural differences are. So I'm not sure yet we're at the point of, but well, particularly in my context here in exploiting these amazing opportunities. We're, we're more information sharing about what the different contexts are and cultures. I don't, Johnny, I don't know if you're further ahead. Yeah, I think it's really, uh, <clears throat> it's really about keeping an open mind. I think that's the, um, that's, that's the key. Um, and not, not everyone has, uh, has, ex has tried it yet, experienced it yet. And, and I think the, as I was saying it, I think the, for a lot of the reasons that John just referred to. I think the um, adoption of it is, you know, it's not not going to be uh, hugely rapid. But the 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 techno technology has a habit of kind of uh, catching out industries that are uh, that are slow slow to adopt um, uh, because you know it is it is going to be able ultimately to change the way that all sorts of television is made. As so not not just high end. TV and movies, but also commercials. We've done a few commercials using these techniques uh, with very, very good results. Um, and I think that the applications for it, as the uh, as more and more people use it, and the price of the and the cost of the hardware drops, I think it's going to present all sorts of opportunities for uh, uh, producers in different genres that we haven't really thought about yet. And it'll just take you know the creative minds that operate yeah. in development yeah. teams to really uh you know to come to come to tackle that that challenge but once uh someone you know kind of successfully i don't know manages to cross over 
a piece of game IP with you know a live uh, or, or unscripted uh, competition that is you know streamed in so, you know kind of um, a, you know and that gets a big audience. Someone will crack something like that at some point, and there's going to be all these different crossovers of and and mixes of genre. That's what tends to happen when a when a technology changes in into it kind of launches a whole new subgenre. And I, I, I'm really excited to to watch that happen. Um, but by definition, quite unpredictable. Yeah. And just just to build on that, just say we're finding that this is a space that traditional film and TV producers and crew are really interested in, and we run lots of free labs funded by mm -hmm. UK Research and Innovation through our Story Futures um, Centre, and other, there are other examples of that. But whenever we put out a virtual production lab for you know traditional film and TV producers, we get inundated with people who want to do it. So okay, well that's, that's good to know. <laughs> that's good to know. So uh, Rona, I want to bring you in. So you you obviously are, as you say, you know, at the talent end of this mm -hmm. and you work with a lot of gamers. We've mentioned uh, Dan TDM, but I think there's some other ones and you probably know them better than I do. Yami, I think is one of yours. Um, so what what are you seeing? Is there starting to be this kind of, you know, these kind of talents want to work in another genre in television and film? Because, I mean, I remember at one point doing a story about YouTubers and and the YouTuber said, well, I don't really want to be on TV. I, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I like being on YouTube. I don't need to be on TV because I think of YouTube as different than TV. So how are you, what are you seeing with your, your talent? Yeah, so I'm, and I should say, like Chris said, I remember in our briefing call, I'm not a gamer. And one of the things that me and Elspeth say all the time is that oh, we're not gamers, but it's, it's not necessarily about being a consumer of that content. For us, we're, we're on the periphery of something that's a very exciting industry to identify where engaged audiences are, what they care about. I mean, our talent specifically are at this very interesting cross section of YouTube, Twitch, and Minecraft. Um, Minecraft, I know everyone loves the stat, has over 1 trillion views on YouTube. That in itself is, you know, some, something is happening within Minecraft and within the creators in the world of Minecraft that is really exciting to producers and managers because we're seeing, like, for example, one of our talent, Tommy Innit, um, he had the most watched Minecraft stream. It's 697,000 people all watching at the same time, the finale yeah. of a... Um, a, almost a scripted show that they created within Minecraft. That in itself, you know, we was you know mind blown. And for talent like Tom and Dan and Yami, they are interested in collaborating with the right people. I think previously there's been that lack of respect, or almost um, you know TV producers coming onto calls and um, maybe being a bit snobby or maybe being a bit patronizing about who these talent are. And I guess. The reason that we set up Monray was to say this is a legitimate right. part of the entertainment industry. These talent are often really young, come into a lot of money. They become very wealthy at a very young age and they need protected. They have ideas. They create stories. There is IP in what they're doing on YouTube that they don't even know they're doing. So our role is about putting people around them you know, to, to help them have legacy and to help them create these concepts and characters, if that is what they want to do, you know, that's that's our, our whole reason that we started right. the business. I was, I was at, so I was just going to say, I was at um, BBC Studios just before I started Monray, mm -hmm. specifically facilitating workshops between digital talent and writers in scripted or with... Um, unscripted development producers and I was thinking why why is this not happening across the board why are we not bringing people into a room and just see what happens so when I met Elspeth she was at Endemol and she was producing live shows with specifically with YouTubers so I thought you know BBC Studios Endemol YouTube you know surely if we throw this into the mix something interesting is going to come out of it and you know thankfully it has it would be interesting to find out do it if RTS did a survey of I don't know how many people you would have to ask of young people what they would rather be a maker of a blockbuster game 
film or TV series and see what the outcome would be from that to measure ambition. Because the cultural and societal change now mm -hmm. is massive. And yeah. to the point about Minecraft, because given the agency of construction and control, digital Lego, I mean, people like making stuff and being part of stuff rather mm -hmm. than just being passive receptors of stuff. So yeah. it'd be quite interesting to say what the ambition would be. And then yeah. it'll also be reflected in the content that's created thereafter. That's a really good question. So Chris Salvatore, can I ask you, when you, you I mean, this is an interesting area we're in here now. You know, is there, how do you balance a director's vision or, or you know, someone like a Craig Mays who's a writer's vision with giving the audience the feeling that they can be involved in the story? Um, you know, because that seems to be what this sort of interactive gaming world is all about. They build things. If they're on Minecraft, they're building something. If they're in Fortnite, they're creating something. So is that important or is, or do you think it's the job of television and film to, to create a narrative linear arc and that's, that's what we do. I, I I think it's I think it's about emotional investment, really. Um, mm -hmm. And you can feel invested in different ways. I mean, you can have some uh, control over the the characters you're if you're playing the game. Um, obviously, you don't have that kind of interactive control if you're watching a TV show. But um, it, it, it's up to us to sort of draw you in, to pull you in, um, uh, even though you are not in control. Um, and it, it's up to us to want to to make you want to find out what happens next. Um, um, so so I think it, there's an interaction there um, with regard to emotional investment that our creators, Craig and Neil, sort of fundamentally understood the differences between the mediums. Um, can I just say something? I, I, yes, uh, please. I, I've, I've heard over that there's been a, a slight, slight theme of um, film and television uh, industry being, I don't know, dismissive or, or, or disrespectful or a bit snobby. Uh, towards other uh, people involved in other aspects of the industry. And on behalf of the film and television industry, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> um, and and I think, frankly, the entertainment industrial complex is, is shifting. And I think that's great. Um, and I think we, um, we ignore that at our own peril. Um, so to the extent that we can be open to other opportunities and talent and appreciate that you know, it's not necessarily tele film and television isn't necessarily the holy grail. It's just a a a, a part of the process um, and an aspect of the entertainment business. I think we'll be okay. I would add to that. You know, convergence and collaboration is certainly there, and to the benefit of all parties. Mm -hmm. Of course, it makes sense for that collaboration because it generates success in in all the mediums. But it's you know, it's. Uh, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, well, that's well, a really I, important I, point. I was just going to say the thing that the video games and has always lacked is celebrity. Film yeah, and yeah. TV has had their stars and celebrated as stars, and the games industry has never had that. So now I think it's just the size of the industry and the cultural and societal impact it's having has created its own, you know, aura of uh, wowness. Mm. That's an interesting point. Yeah, it's sort of one of the big stars. Of course, in the gaming world, and I'm, Ron knows about this, you know, in the gaming world, there are some very big stars. I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm dating myself here, but PewDiePie was obviously a big, a big deal. Uh, and he was, a, you know, he would, he could draw in crowds to Wembley, for heaven's sakes. Uh, yeah, to but, but the, to yeah PewDiePie is hugely influential, but it's nevertheless, he's a commentator. He's not. Yeah, that's true. Great. He's a commentator. No, I'm talking about the, the the stars themselves who create the content are not known. You ask anybody who's in the game outside of the game industry if they could name anybody in it, they probably can't. Right. Good point. That could be a question for uh, for the for the chat. Who can name a big star <laughs> in the game industry? Um, I've got a couple of questions here from the audience, so let's just get through this. We've got um, uh, Eva. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name. Eva. She says, Red versus Blue, the Mach Machinima series, was one of the original success stories for taking game IP and reinventing it for a series. This is a question for Chris, she says. 
how will we convince studios to con consider more pitches that develop this from inception? Also, a side note, Disney has trademarked the term story living. I, never, I didn't know that, story living. So Chris, do you have an answer to that? Can you, do you know what she's talking I'm not, about? I'm not sure I follow it exactly, um, but uh, I, I think I think we need again as a as an industry just to be open to different forms of storytelling kind of coming in the door um, mm -hmm. and then having a mutual respect and and uh, collaboration. Um, you know, where we I think get into trouble as an industry is when we say, you know, thanks, we got this. Like we know yeah. we know our <laughs> format, you know, we know our audience. You know, I think what The Last of Us has shown and and what we're all discussing today is how there's a convergence of of these audiences and and a, 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 an overlap of these audiences. Yeah, and the gaming industry loves you for it. I mean, they're having you know Pedro Pascal as Joel and Bella Ramsey as Ellie and the dialogue and the relationship between them, the gamers are saying, at last they understand us and let there be more of it. Mm. Right. Here's another question. It says on YouTube, there are full playthrough recordings of The Last of Us Part Two that have been viewed, according to this uh, questioner, 9 million times. This is a massive audience, that's true, watching something interactive, but with the interactivity stripped out. Is this a competitor to the potential TV adaptation of, of things? YouTube seems to be coded differently. So I don't know, is that something you can talk about, Chris? Is, that, is there, um, is there a competition going on? <laughs> yeah. I. I... I mean, I don't don't mean to sound snobby or anything, but but I I I think they're different. I really yeah, do. I, I, I think too. there's just a different experience of uh, watching, you know, a live action premium series that's designed to uh, kind of draw you into its world and its story, and um, watching a playthrough on um on youtube I, I just think they're different different experiences neither you know better nor worse but just different they're complementary mm. yeah i think that's fair mm -hmm. johnny slowly here's one for you um where would someone start or maybe for anybody because it, it mentions sony but it could be for anybody um where would someone start in having a collaborative conversation about making a game into a tv series Either a Sony owned IP or some other kind of IP. So well, I, I think, yeah, I think that's good. Like internally now at Sony, it's interesting, you know, they talk about the relative, um, uh, you know, kind of values or positions, if you like, of video games and TV in the world. And within Sony, obviously, there is uh, PlayStation. <clears throat> and PlayStation is absolutely the commercial holy grail of everything within Sony, right? Everything is benchmarked against the success of that of that, that business these days. So I think within Sony, um, there is a sort of natural place for that to happen. It actually comes the, through uh, a bunch of guys that work for PlayStation. I think it's a, a, that's another reason why I think they acquired, uh, wanted to acquire Pixel because it, it, it had some applied uh, uh, delivery to, to to that as well. I think that that's something that um, is being is being worked out. But I think that you know there is a relatively standard way to you know to um, to pitch a a, a, a network. Um, and I and I think that the people that work in that world, the agencies and development teams and uh, network executives, uh, uh, you know, it's it's about working I think it's really about and Chris probably is a better place to answer this question really but what's a convincing pitch for a, a, a network executive it's something that has an audience already that has been thought through to the nth degree by people that are experienced and clever and are convincing you know that that they'll be able to create something which is uh, which is extremely uh, compelling um and there's you know there's a system for that and I, uh, and it's it's almost as old as time and it involves a lot of shoe leather <laughs> um and uh, a lot of conversations but um i think you know the, the the finding the trick is finding the initial collaborators 
the actual people who are going to uh, go through that process together. And I think being able to put that together successfully, there's a lot of value to be created there. And I, I would say um, that that's especially uh, likely to happen in a place like the UK, where uh, it's partly why uh, we're now based fr from here. It has all of the production ecosystem uh, that's you know uh, uh, world renowned, and it also has a long history of um, training people um, and uh, to um, you know to become video games developers as well as visual effects artists. There's a thriving community here, so I think the UK angle on this is is actually quite interesting. So they can't pitch you is what is the short answer. Well, they they could try. I don't know if it would be as effective as pitching Chris, but you might find it's harder to get in Chris's calendar than mine. I just say, did, did oh, people, don't throw me under the bus like that. Did, did people see in the Observer on Sunday Mark Sweeney's article? Because he he gave some numbers to this. It doesn't sound like there's a problem. He said in the 90s, there were 59 adaptations from game into film and TV. And since the 2020s, there's been 57 already with 40 more in development. So it doesn't sound like, going back to Johnny's point, it sounds like people are finding those connections and pitching them to the right people. The, but the common denominators, the Rotten Tomato scores are mostly in the teens. Uh, uh, yes. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, we have a couple minutes left. I'm going to try to get through two more. It looks like two more questions here. Um, this is interesting. I think we sort of touched on this. Uh, we talked a lot, says this questioner, about games potentially coming, um, TV adaptations or films. What about going the other way? What about a a TV or film becoming a game. And I don't know, maybe Ian knows more about this than I do, but have there been those kind of things out there? Um, have... Many, many, many. I mean, and do they work well? Yes. They've worked very well for some of the bigger titles, but I think games companies are more interested in creating their own IP and licensing it the other way now. Yeah. And clearly that's what's happening. And as we've said endlessly, the, the, the the bar has been raised by The Last of Us and long may that continue. But, um, it's definitely a two-way street. Mm -hmm. And then I have one more. It says, um, what video game franchise would the panel like to see converted to TV and or film? There, that's a loaded one. <laughs> you, you probably have a view on that one, Johnny. I don't know if you have a view. Chris, you're well, not you a gamer, so you may not have a view on this one. <laughs> but uh, you're looking at if you're looking at numbers, you'd have to look at something like Grand Theft Auto. I mean, there's a game, Grand Theft Auto 5, released in 2013, generates a billion dollars in three days of sales. It's a large entertainment <laughs> franchise uh, in any medium. Yeah. And therefore, it kind of, I'm surprised a film hasn't yet come out. Um, also, you could talk about Minecraft. I mean, that's going to make it, it would make an incredible movie again if it was done correctly. But there are there are so many amazing IPs in the games world that haven't even been scratched yet. And there's a, yeah. there's a rich mine there waiting for somebody who's exhausted the minds of comics and, and traditional Hollywood IP. Ian, do you think Grand Theft Auto hasn't happened because it's a risk to them, to Rocksteady, that if it's bad, it damages the franchise? Maybe now is the time, as yeah. we've spoken. Any other ideas about that, Ron? Yeah, I was I was going to just make one point that I feel hasn't been made. That um, Well, I attribute one of the successes of The Last of Us to the fact that it's a young female hero at the heart of it. And diversity in gaming is something that has been an issue and that was one of the the bullet points when Elspeth and I set up our company is there are not enough female executives making good stuff or inserting themselves in a very male dominated industry and I just thought that one of the most lovely things about that show is that it's a a young girl who is the hero and is the one that's going to save the world and I think a lot of young girls who maybe haven't seen themselves in gaming will watch that show already be gamers. Well, well Lara Croft was a female character in the 90s but apart from that it's a relatively young industry and it was started as you say by mm -hmm. by and making predominantly male focused content but now it's a completely divergent pool of content creators and consumers so i think you're yep. going to see much more change in in both creativity and consumption of games going forward to reflect all parts of society which is obviously a good thing yeah. I'd be interested to see, because I love Westerns, Red, Red Dead Redemption, which I loved as a game, and I think that would be a brilliant thing to see in a 
film or TV show. Cool. Okay. So my my going? answer would be uh, my answer would be The Last of Us Two. <laughs> yes, well, they, haven't you already commissioned it? <laughs> my answer would be my fighting fancy game books turn into interactive TV. <laughs> there way. you go. There you go. I love that. Well, I think we have to close up. I'm afraid um, because we've just come over the the um, minute over. I think time here. So I'm going to I'm going to close. There are there are a couple more questions. So this has obviously been a very um, interesting session for the audience as well. So thank you, audience. Uh, somebody in the audience says Minecraft movie is due out in 2025. I didn't know that, but that, according to somebody in the audience, that's true. Um, so uh, I obviously need to thank some people. Thank thank you to obviously the panel for um, for doing this, uh, particularly for Chris who woke up early in LA to do this. Uh, so thank you to Ian to John Wardell, to John Johnny Slow, uh, and also to uh, Mon Ray. And did I miss anybody? Yes, no, I think I already got everybody that time. Uh, I also wanna thank our producers, Ashling uh, and Dan Korn, Ashling O'Connor and Dan Korn. They were very instrumental in making this all happen. Thank you to the RTS for hosting this. Obviously, thank you to the audience um, for listening and for participating. And I'm sorry, we didn't get to all of your questions, um, but I thank you for, Coming. I hope you'll come into another RTS and National uh, Committee event. And I'm Kate Bulkley. Have a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody.